Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. You're about to listen to my conversation with Dr. Jim Meehan, an incredible physician focused on male optimization, specific conversations today about all things masculinity, ultimately how testosterone is impacting our lives, the lifestyle interventions you should all be considering, and ultimately how Jim has worked for the last 30 years to become a master of testosterone optimization. Uh, some incredible conversations, some deep insights into just how to be a better man. Uh, we definitely got into living our own parenting, around relationships, and ultimately the uh, maybe call it intangible factors that are affecting your natural produ testosterone production, or even if you're taking exogenous testosterone, the things you should be doing to increase or optimize your body's ability to use testosterone. Just acknowledging that just because you're taking testosterone doesn't necessarily mean it's going to maximally be effective in your body. You still have to be doing those incredibly important lifestyle intervention things that I talk about just constantly. Got to move. You got to eat well. You got to you got to sleep well. You got to manage stress. And guys, th this is not hard, right? I know I'm preaching to the choir, but this stuff is not hard. It just takes practice. It just takes understanding the next steps. And this is what we do here at Muscle Intelligence. We're here to support you, ultimately live your greatest life in a body you love. Gents, you can love your body. You can love your life. You can feel so much better than you ever had in 2024 just simply by knowing the next best step for you, which is maybe not the same as it is for me. It's maybe not the same as for somebody else. And the next best step may not be just taking testosterone. It may be important for you, but it may not work for you. There, there's definitely some nuance to how you should supplement with testosterone or how you should not supplement with testosterone and ultimately look at all the potential ways you can be optimizing your testosterone naturally first. I say we treat everyone like a natural athlete, whether you're taking testosterone or not. We have to optimize what we need to optimize, the basic things that every human needs to function. Basic, healthy, foundational human physiology is at the root of a healthy life. I've never felt better in my life. I've been doing a lot of really interesting new things, looking into longevity modalities, looking into hormone optimization, looking into stem cells, optimizing my supplements, optimizing my microbiome, my nutrition, obviously always optimizing my training. And guys, we're getting better with age. And if you're someone who wants to get better with age, you're in the right place. Muscle intelligence in 2024 is diving hard in muscle building. We're diving hard in longevity. We're diving hard into optimizing intelligence and relationships and ultimately, so we can ultimately be the best man. Enjoy the podcast today with Dr. Jim Meehan. Today's podcast is brought to you by our friends, by Optimizers. Again, guys, if you're not taking magnesium, if you're not taking digestive enzymes, you're missing out. Uh, magnesium is certainly the most deficient mineral in the body, especially if you train or you're stressed, you're going to be deficient. And the benefit of Optimizers is actually seven different types of magnesium. So all those different chelates can be absorbed at different rates. They can actually affect different tissues in the body. Take that product. I take between two and six tablets a day, depending on how much I train. If I don't train, I'll probably take two. If I'm training hard, if I'm under a lot of stress, working a lot, I'll take up to six. And I'll spread them out throughout the day. And man, the difference in my sleep, the difference in the way I feel when I wake up is noticeable. It's palpable. And I, I take mastimes every day. Anytime I consume a meat um, containing meal, which is every meal, by the way, um, I, I always take them because I know after 40, my ability to, to di digest, absorb, and assimilate protein is decreased. And we actually need more protein as we age, gents. So again, head over to buyoptimizers.com and use the code MUSCLE10. If for whatever reason you forget this or you forget any of our codes or any of our links, head over to muscleintelligence.com, click on the link for podcast. You can have all of our sponsors there. Uh, gosh, thank you for listening. Thank you for being a listener of the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I'm so pumped going into 2024. With I feel invigorated after our recent um, year-end trip to Costa Rica, which I'll share with you. If I haven't already, I will in due time. Enjoy the podcast with Dr. Jim Mietten. We are in a very serious time in history in which we're seeing the end of men, a crisis of our hormonal physiology that's under attack. I mean, there's, and the only way I can see it is enemy action. I mean, the way our food has become a toxic waste uh, and the biggest toxins that's, you know, destroying our food is estrogen like molecules mm -hmm. that, you know, atrazine, glyphosate, the active ingredient, and Roundup, and a thousand other yeah. estrogen like yeah. molecules. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, BPA, et cetera. And so these things are destroying men. Yeah, Jim, do you think it's a matter of someone having bad intentions, actually, or do you think it's a matter of profits just driving every decision? Yeah, it's a combination of the both. You know, so 
there's a lot of greed and corruption and just, you know, profit seeking by, you know, men and women that have no moral center. They don't serve something greater than themselves. So they're easily influenced. They'll do anything. You know, they're sociopaths. And there's a lot more serious sociopathy in the population. But there's got, you know, at the at the highest levels, there's intent. There's yeah. got to be. There's only, you know, there is no way that we can, you know, and you've seen it during the pandemic when when we are pretending that eight mice uh, antibody levels are enough to justify a, an experimental vaccine of six month old children. That's that's that isn't science. That, that's something else. And so there's a lot of and, and I think some of these vaccines are one of the biggest attacks on hormonal function in the population. It's been going on for a long time. It's not just the COVID vaccines. It's not this new infrastructure. It's other vaccines like Gardasil, which are notorious for shutting down ovarian and testicular production. And it's all in the science. It's not, this isn't, you know, this isn't made up stuff from Jim Meehan. You know, this is in the medical literature. They just don't want you to see that part of the literature. And they do a great job of preventing you from seeing it. I mean, one of the things that made me, that kind of woke me up in this process of how broken medicine is, is I was a medical editor of a medical journal for many years in my early career. I saw the studies not getting published because they cast down on a pharmaceutical company that was a major donor to a university like mine, Washington University in St. Louis. And I was told, we're not going to publish these two studies, Jim. You didn't miss anything. You checked off all the boxes. The, the science was sound, but the science was inconvenient. And so if we published it, um, you would lose your job. I would lose my job. The journal would probably shut down for lack, you know, funding and, and advertisement. That's how the sausage is being made. Yeah. The, the literature is untrustable. It's incomplete because you, you know, too many studies that are negative studies looking, you know, um, casting down on a pharmaceutical company or a product, they don't get published. Yeah. And then what does get published is the bought and paid for fraudulent contrived nonsense that is easily discernible if you know what you're doing. But my my profession, many doctors, many scientists, the lay people, they're looking at titles and abstracts, conclusions. You could I could read you a, a hundred, you know, top level supposedly pieces of scientific literature that people cite all the time that the the data doesn't even support the conclusion. The conclusion was absolutely contrived and fraudulent to send a different message than what the the data actually um supported no it's it's all over the place and it sounds like you're trying a correlation there between the demasculinization demasculinization of men and their ability to not stand up for what's right you know a a man in my mind is like yes he has a belief like hey man you're doing something wrong we have to have integrity and moral a moral compass but because maybe they're not as masculine, maybe they're not as confident, maybe they don't have the independence to go, man, I, I may not have this job in a month or a week, but I'll have another job and I'll have a job that I love that actually is doing something right. You put those dots together perfectly. That's exactly what I'm talking about is, you know, it's like the old saying, hard times create hard men, hard men create good times, good times create soft men, soft men create hard times. Mm-hmm. Well, Soft men are creating hard times that we're all having to endure right now. Yeah. But that it's been a it's been a softening that's been going on for fifty years. The yeah. the decline in hormones, the rise in infertility, the you know, the body compositional and athleticism that we saw when we were in high well, you're younger than I am, but when I was in high school, you know, versus what you see in high schools today, I mean yeah. The kids are, you know, there's a reason why we have so many of our young children in our schools confused about not only their gender, but their species. They're growing up in a sea of estrogens in the womb of their mothers that don't know any better and are consuming this, you know, this toxic waste we call food. The chicken isn't chicken. You know, the pork isn't pork. And our our cattle are, they're all eating trash and nutrients. It's slathered in at least two doses of glyphosate, you know, per growing season. And, and that's, you know, that's going to destroy any 
species on the planet, but it's really destroying us. And and we're intelligent enough to be able to recognize that this can't be this can't be sustainable. But we have unfortunately we have too many of those soft men seeking you know affirmation and um, a the strokes of publicity to become a politician, and then they sell out to pharma, or you know they get honey potted on Epstein Island or whatever it is that gets them to become something less than what they're supposed to, and not protectors of the public, but instead perpetrators of crime upon crimes upon humanity. There is no way we should be feeding our children this, and but it a lot of you know a lot of it has has come around to the fact that we're you know how many fathers in the family are just you know they're addicted to porn and video games and they don't want to get in the gym and you know the thought of jujitsu or pounding on a heavy bag or lifting iron is just or just walking around the block a couple of times is just something you know why. Why should they, you know, why would they? And I like to try to help them answer that. But when you're locked in the discomfort of, of health that is so poor, when your brain is so inflamed, when you're, you're fat, you're sick, you're weak, you're inflamed, you're depressed. I've been there many years ago. I was there, but where you, when you're in that place, you know, you can't, all you can hear is the scream of your own body for your own brain for dopamine so you're you're just you know you're addicted to your media you're watching pornography you're doing drugs drinking alcohol you know Krispy Kremes Mountain Dew McDonald's and they got you you're just a useless you know consumer your cattle that they're herding any place they want to go and you do you know and, and you're literally you're 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 manipulatable you're hypnotizable and that's what we saw during the pandemic. True. We had your primal urges. Yeah. Yeah. That's all you can, you know, and so you'll do anything that some guy, in a, you know, or lady in a white coat tells you to do, you know, um, as ridiculous as that may be, you know, wear two masks by yourself in your car on the way to the monkeypox vaccine clinic. Let's go. You know, you got people still doing that. And Jim, one of the things you said there that I really want to lean in on is this is happening in utero. This is happening with big, with babies and their yeah. mother's uterus. And so when I look at, men, you know, call it, I don't want to even give an age demographic, but like it's called the younger men right now. They're absolutely feminized. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and and I often will say, Jim, it's not their fault, nor is it our fault, but it is our responsibility. And as men, it's our responsibility to acknowledge like, hey, something's broken. And it's really hard, I'm sure, when they're inside the, the fishbowl looking out to see what the, you know, what's on the label on the outside. So like, there needs to be someone who's, who's acknowledging like, hey, your children are drowning in estrogens that are, as you say, demasculinizing them. And the thing that I want to acknowledge also in what you said, the absence of testosterone is so is so important, so integral to this feminization of men because men need to acknowledge that testosterone has this amazing ability to make pain feel good, right? So when we start getting into those harder workouts or doing something that is challenging, the higher testosterone, you're like, oh, I really enjoy this. Mm-hmm. And if our testosterone is low, any type of discomfort feels like work. And I think a lot of people are stuck in that in that spiral of, gosh, this is so uncomfortable. I don't want to do it. I'm just going to get in the hedonistic loop of like scrolling social media, pornography, and food. That is, as you say, it's hard to get out. Yeah, that's a really interesting thought. You know, that about how testosterone, it, it certainly does that as you described. And there's a lot of nuances here. There's a lot, we're, we're talking about some stuff that doesn't have, you know, tremendous scientific evidence of, but we all know it intuitively. It's like, if you've ever been deficient in testosterone and then you go to a place where you're closer to your optimum level, it's like somebody turned the lights on again. You know, you, you often, you get there so slowly like that frog, you know, boiling in a pot, or it's, it's the analogy often used, it's like you, the room was bright, but somebody's dimming the light so slowly, you don't realize how dark it is until you can't see anything. And then you get your hormones replaced and, and people will come back for their follow-up visit in my office two or three weeks later. And they're like, holy crap, you were right. Yeah. You know, I could already feel the brain-based effects. I feel like, you know, there's hope for the future again. I, I'm, you know, not only is my 
energy, my focus, my libido better, but I literally feel like building something again. And I think it's that, it's that desire to, it's that drive to achieve something, you know, to build, to create, whether it be, you know, turning your body into a weapon, your mind into, you know, a engine of creation. Uh, I don't know what it is, but it's, man, it's powerful. And when you're, the corollary of that is when you're deficient, you're powerless. You're literally, you know, you're just, you're wasting air. You know, you're taking up space and too many, too many men and women feel this way. In fact, young men and young women are feeling this way increasingly today, Ben. And it's, that's the greatest, you know, that's the greatest tragedy is that they today, you know, this, this decline and, and hormones that we've been seeing for 50 years. And we're, this is the worst we've ever seen it. I see 20, you know, 20 and early thirties quite commonly with testosterone levels below the, the laboratory reference range for total and free testosterone. And, and I think, you know, they are, they are not enjoying the best years, some of the best years of their life. They're going to be they're They're going to, be where many 80 year old, 90 year old men and women are, unfortunately. And they're being, that's being stolen from them. Yeah. So, so much wisdom in there. And, uh, just, just want to acknowledge that for all the men listening out there, I always like to talk to, to men and then obviously to dads, because there's, there's a few things in life that are worth being neurotic about. And I think being neurotic about protecting what goes into your children should be on the top of the list of priorities for most parents out there, because if you're not going to do it, uh, nobody else will. It's not going to happen by accident. And you know, not everyone thinks about the value of giving your child every advantage. We often talk about, I want them to have all the things I didn't have as a kid financially. But what they need above all is is not necessarily financial freedom. They need physical freedom and psychological freedom and the ability to to confidently move through life. Like if I can give my kids anything, it's confidence, right? I want them to feel physical confidence, mental confidence. And if I don't, if I if in any way stagnate their hormonal development, I'm taking away the very opportunity that every dad in the world ultimately, I think, intuitively wants, where we have this intuitive desire to provide and protect. But Absolutely. in our culture, we're like, oh, pro the providing is I need to give them nice shoes or I need to give them a nice house. And I'm like, no, you don't. You need to give them the vitality and, and the belief in themselves that they can do anything. If you, if you died and give them nothing, but you give them confidence and a belief in themselves, their life is going to be incredible. If you leave them $100 million, but they're fat sacks of estrogen, it's yeah. going to be a horrible life. They're going to be depressed, using drugs, and, and chasing the hedonistic pursuit that so many people are. So again, yeah. this, is a little, this is a little subjective, but like, I think I just want to wake the dads up and like, hey man, if you're, going to, if you're going to spend money on something, spend money on your kid's health and the food you eat and invest in yourself, invest in your health. And teach them now because, you know, uh, otherwise they're going to be pulled into very extraordinarily brilliant marketing that will tell them that it's okay to eat those, you know, those nacho cheese, um, potato chips or crispy or Halloween Mountain Dew or McDonald's. Christmas or Thanksgiving. Oh yeah. These, they, uh, just the materialism. Yeah. Yeah. Teach your kids that if you, if you continue to eat like all of your other classmates, you're going to end up just as lost and weak and unable to, you know, complete that two mile run test. Those, you know, two minutes of push-ups over a hundred, you know, the things that, that we were, it was easy for us to do yeah. 30, 40 years ago. The thing, Jim, that we're both going to, you know, suffer with ultimately, if, if we're saying, hey, I want you to be more like me and less like your children or less like your friends, yeah. you're creating segregation, right? So if the, if the kids value their friends, like, oh, my parents don't understand me. They want me to be like them and not like, them. and I see that as a parent, like that could grow sideways really quickly. Like if you're like, yeah. hey, you don't want to be like your like one of my son's friends has has breasts as a boy. Mm -hmm. I was, and yeah. his parents made him a vegan when he was like four. I was like, well, he's got breasts because he's over consuming estrogen. He's not consuming any meat. He's fat. He's got breasts. And I was like, dude, but that's not the way people are supposed to look. And it's not his fault. But like, yeah. it, you know, it's a really bad existence. And my son's like, oh, he's my best friend, and he's got these things running off his chest. And he, at, you know, at the time, he's eight years old. Mm -hmm. And so like. You know, what do you do in that situation where you're like, oh, you don't want to be like that. You don't want to make fun of them. You know, it's, 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 no. there's so many challenging situations as, uh, yeah. as parents to, to kind of have to navigate. Yeah. Yeah. But what you're doing is you're instilling in your child something that he can then share 
with his friends, as he loves and cares for his friends, he, he will share that kind of information to help guide them and become, you know, his own little evangelist. I, I've loved some of the greatest joys in my life of listening, you know, overhearing my my sons and daughters talking to their friends and explaining why, you know, they take fish oil every day or something like that, you know. Um, it makes your brain better. And, you know, and this is, I, I'm recalling a specific incident between two little nine-year-olds, you know, and um, and that's the kind of thing that can make big, you know, big differences, big changes. But yeah, you're right. I mean, this is a world in which I don't know what it is about, but we need to give less to our kids. You know, we need to give less things, that materialistic stuff. is. And, and in fact, we need to teach them how important it is to become autonomous and capable and, and no, you don't need a iPad and the latest, you know, three, $400 basketball shoes. You know, that's not going to make the difference between you and the next guy. That's just you buying into the materialism, but that's a part of the, what happens in our brains when we become broken, soft, want to give everything too much has been given to us. Um, you know, I, I became a part-time farmer about a year and a half ago so that I could raise my kids and my grandkids, two of my daughters and their families moved out to the land with us. And, you know, we're, we're raising chickens and pigs and cows and horses and grandkids. And, so, um, it's, uh, it's a different world. We're living a, in a, you know, in a world that my, my grandkids get up at, 6 30 in the morning on saturday and they go charging outside and they're gone all day like i was yeah. you know but i mean i i do remember raising my own kids and i didn't want them to go jump on their bike and ride six miles like i used to to the comic book shop and and back you know i mean it's it's i it's a it's a more dangerous world there's more predators out there and why is that well i there's there's less cheap sheepdogs out there too yeah one thing I, I i try to instill in everyone is you know getting past the, the materialistic pursuit is so important because yeah you know we often feel like we have to keep up with everyone around we have to keep up with the house or the cars or the or the shoes and the clothes but once you start to realize that like confidence comes from within and not from things you 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 acquire now again and i say that uh, obviously, that's something you're very familiar with, but it doesn't seem super common amongst the adults I speak with. It, you know, people get stuck in the hedonistic loop of like, oh, I have to pursue the nicest things. And listen, I love nice things too, but it doesn't change the confidence, right? It doesn't change who I am. It doesn't change how I feel about myself. Um, you know, the, the way the thing that changes how I feel about myself is how I show up, how I show up in my life, how I show up in my health, how I show up in my family, and the things that I value most. And and it seems like. Um, men need models, right? And again, I certainly am someone who models. And so the more that we can bring people like yourself and, and other amazing guests on the on the podcast, like, hey, let's talk about how we actually embody this. So Jim, I'd love to have you walk through like some of your daily uh, non-negotiables around yourself, your family, your business, because, you know, I, I'm assuming everyone listening is probably working a job, maybe owns a business, maybe they're a professional or a doctor. I'm like, man, I'm I'm burning the midnight oil. Like I'm I'm, I'm working si sixteen hours a day, trying to get my workout in, trying to get my sleep in. The world has so many demands on us now to try to keep up. You know, even with you know the way the economy is right now with inflation, um, man, some people are struggling. You know, you got to work twice as much and twice as hard. And, and yeah, where do you find time to eat well? Or where do you find time to work out? So like, what are your what are your uh, what's your advice to people right now who find themselves grinding? And the struggle, and they're like, "Hey, man, I don't even know that I can, I can make the time to train or eat well." Yeah, well, I mean, step one is get your health in order, and and I would say that you know, diet and exercise, yeah, all of those things, you got to get your hormones because a lot of that not wanting to get up in the morning. You know, I get up early in the morning. Uh, I make my side of the bed. My wife is still sleeping. I'm gonna. You know, I'm going to do some functional mo movement exercises, but I, I that all comes after I get in. I'm a follower of Christ, so I get into the Bible. I read God's Word. That really refreshes my uh, my spirit, gets me started for the day. I do my functional exercises, pretty much just push-ups, crunches, and squats. If I do nothing else that day, that I'm going to get I'm going to get those three functional movements done. I you know, and fast too. I teach my patients this: How many push-ups can you do in two minutes? 
Mm-hmm. You know, you might start at 12 and before you know, it's 86. And um, same thing with the uh, crunches or cat vomits. And you, I give them different options, but something for all the major muscle groups. And then I've got to, you know, then I got to get ready and drive in about 40 minute drive. So that's when I'm listening to podcasts and and keeping my mind fresh. Muscle and intelligence, of course, right, Jim? Absolutely. A lot of that recently, too, by the way. As I <laughs> said earlier, I just, I've really enjoyed listening to, I learn a lot from my colleagues in medicine. Um, you've had some great, you know, people on that have really great ideas, some trash ideas, but, you know, that's, <laughs> we maybe they're not trash ideas, but we just disagree on some areas. But um, there's always something to learn from everyone. And I look at that, uh, that's the way I look at it. Um, I don't work anymore. Um, I say that, I mean, I see 12 to 15 patients every day, but it's just not work. I love it. You know, I, now I started my career as a surgeon, as an eye surgeon in particular, and I hated it. It, it, it was work, you know, it was like made tons of money. It was, I chose one of the elite medical specialties off ophthalmology out of my, you know, I was top of my class in medical school and, and did really well. So I, I kind of, more of a narcissist back then. I chose ophthalmology because it's very lucrative, not much call, lots of control of your practice, and a good balance between surgery and patient care. But I became more surgery-based, and it just sucked my soul. I just didn't enjoy it. I like talking to people. So I I, I later re, um, pivoted and retrained, and, and you know, and John Chrysler would have called it, uh, God rest his soul. But I kind of function a lot in preventive medicine as well. So uh, anyway, my practice is very busy. I see I'm licensed in about 38 states. So I see patients from all over the United States. Uh, I have a a big team that helps me in that. I've got a physician assistant. We're growing all the time. I usually do work a little bit later than I should. I about the time of COVID, I had to stop doing my, I'm a martial artist. I've been doing jujitsu and uh, fifth degree black belt and taekwondo, brown belt and judo, and jujitsu is my love because I'm an old wrestler. I I wrestled all the way through through uh, high school and a little bit into college, but um, I had to stop doing jujitsu because I can't go fifty percent or eighty percent. So I was rolling with UFC fighters and beasts that were just tearing me apart. You know, I've had. Um, three or four surgeries because I wouldn't tap. So I've got, you know, I just, I'm getting too old to do that and not be able to, you know, throttle it down. You know, I get, I get, I get in a difficult situation and I just want to go hard and, and they're just like, okay, well, we'll just break you there. Part part of your man, Jim. So here's a, here's a question for you. I'm a slow learner uh, in that regard. Hard hit. So I've, I've really, it sucked for me because I, I am not good. I don't like the gym. It's just never, I mean, I like, hand-to-hand combat and that's yeah. for me that's fun and that's the way I've always stayed in shape but um with injuries that were occurring I had to really slow that down so I'm really struggling with becoming as addicted to weight training as I was jujitsu and uh, martial arts and in particular so uh, oh I hit the the heavy bag a lot that's that's I still love that but um nice. yeah I, I, I have a question for you Jim so you said you had a couple of shoulder injuries, shoulder surgeries. Talk to me about poor hormone protocols, recovery protocols, oh, yeah. peptide, peptide protocols in that realm. That what, what really stands out for you as being a big lever? Yeah, so I've been doing this for a long time. A lot of orthopedists in my market send patients to me to prepare for big surgeries. So, yeah, you got to get your hormones. So l- let's talk about sex hormones here for a second. I, I think my approach is pretty unique because my approach comes from humility. It comes from about 30 years of being a, uh, you know, I damaged my pituitary gland by being knocked out enough times, hit in the face, kicked in the face, middle linebacker, fullback, to damage the pituitary at a point. But at age 35, I had a free testosterone of about 3.6 and a total of 138. So, and I was hurting. I was, you know, fat, sick, inflamed, go to the doctor, get a, uh, antidepressant, statin, weight loss medicine, you know, a, a long blood pressure medicine, get side effects from all of those, you know, keep looking, what's going on? This doesn't make sense. I'm working out as hard as I used to. I'm getting no results. In fact, I'm getting sick because I was breaking my body down faster than that it could heal and repair. And, and so I finally found a doctor, again, this is like 30 years ago, 
that was pretty leading edge, put me on a hormone replacement, just, you know, once a week injection kind of protocol. And it was better. You know, it was like the lights being turned on and things started working again. I started thinking, I was like, hmm, pharmacokinetics, what is the uh, half-life of this? No wonder I feel so bad, you know, five or six days later, let's do this better. And I just went on a crusade. That was when I actually literally went on a crusade. I started training with everyone. I, I even tried to, I was going to go spend some time. I think he was in Belgium at the time or Brussels, but uh, Terry Herzog, who was on your show, um, I wanted to train with him, but that was a little too far. So I trained with Cenogenics and Eternity Medicine in Las Vegas and anybody that I could learn from, I was just hungry to learn because, you know, this was, I had to learn how to control my growth hormone, my thyroid hormone, my sex hormones. So I became an expert on it. And the long story short, what I do is I quickly kind of realized, wow, this is complex stuff. You know, I, uh, we probably know 1% of the story on the complexities of human hormone or any other system in the body. Well, when you don't understand 99%, you better study the healthiest members of the population. You better understand what a healthy young man, middle-aged man, you know, men or women of all kinds, what is, what are their hormones look like, you know, hour to hour, minute to minute over a 24 hour time period. You know, you start to realize men have a 24 hour rhythm. Um, you start to, you know, understand that hormones have a dose dependent, you know, regulation of DNA transcription. So that rhythmicity is probably pretty important. You know, every, why would every man on the planet wake up with the highest levels of the day, typically an erection to match, but ready to jump out of the, the bed and start building and hunting their food or whatever it might be? That rhythm is important, and most hormone replacement programs are not rhythmically restoring your hormones, and so they're depriving you of what might be, you know, 20, 30, maybe 50 percent of what makes hormonal restoration work. So in my approach, I use injectable testosterone to raise your baseline. If you're 200, you, you need to be maybe eight or 900. And by the way, I'll kind of have a conversation with you to find out what your hormonal fingerprint might be. If you're an elite athlete, if you're a, if you're a wrestler, a gymnast, a swimmer, some of the popular, I've studied the Olympic athlete database. I've studied uh, when I was at Washington University uh, um, in St. Louis. We did these very cool wellness studies on elite athletes, the St. Louis Cardinals, for example. And you would find, you know, this 22-year-old natural athlete um, with a total testosterone over 1,800 and a, a free T of like 52.6, I recall. And, um, and it was natural. And we can tell the difference. You know, everybody, I mean, if you know what you're doing, you can tell the difference. So there were, there was, you know, this is the 1990s. There was a guy that wasn't natural, and yet he's still in the Hall of Fame. But the, uh, <laughs> that's probably not, you know, divulging any, you know, information. But you, you see this pattern of an elite athletes, they're in the top one, two, three percent of the population. You never even see laboratory reference ranges that come close to reflecting that. So that'll help me to kind of what your athleticism was in high school and beyond will help me to understand probably what your, you know, your range is going to need to be. I mean, if you're in band and the chess club and, um, you know, I was in the chess club, so I don't want, it's not a big deal, but I, you know, um, I might, but you know, I might put you, your target, maybe seven or 800 or your baseline, and then, you know, try to create a 200 or 300 point elevation in the morning using a transdermal cream applied once a day in the morning to create that 24 hour rhythm. And, um, so we establish the baseline. We create a rhythm with a transdermal cream. And the cream, by the way, gives you also gives you the ability to control your dihydrotestosterone levels. One of the most powerful androgens in the human body is DHT. It's five to seven times more powerful than your testosterone at the androgen receptor. And we men run on DHT. It may be the most important androgen that the body will ever see. And, and, you know, subcutaneous injections will raise it, but not nearly as much as a transdermal does. And um, what skin type you put that transdermal testosterone cream on, and I usually use a uh, 50 milligram per ml, or excuse me, it's a 50 milligram per dose delivery of a transdermal cream, because that's the one, the highest level that's been studied in 
and men for transcrotal delivery. And so I, the highest level of DHT will occur when you put this testosterone cream on the scrotum. Second high, a second highest DHT level will be achieved when you put it on hairy skin, like upper inner thigh is a good example of that. And then relatively hairless skin, like the flank area, the side of your rib cage, upper inner arm, or I think one of the best areas, the love handle area in men, is a um, will give you the lowest levels of DHT. So you can kind of fine tune your DHT levels, Ben, by where you put the cream as well. So that's um, and then I will often, if there's a deficiency in DHEA or pregnenolone, I'll put some of I'll put some of those in that cream as well. However, and because those will be deficient when you're on hormone replacement therapy, and this is something men need to understand, is because of the inhibition of the feedback loops, your pregnenolone and your DHEA will collapse, your pregnenolone in particular. And then when pregnenolone crashes, it's why you get that plateau, or it's part of the reason you get that plateau at about months four to six when you're on a testosterone-only program, kind of windmill, you know, cookie-cutter clinic that's, you know, just giving you this kind of um, minimalist protocol and not paying attention to the entire sex hormone pathway. But that the first hormone in that pathway, the grandfather of all your sex hormones is pregnenolone. And we got to keep that up. So, and I, I'm sorry, do you look like you might have something yeah, to say? Speaking of, speaking of the, those clinics that are just basically the pill mills, a friend of mine sent me his, his report yesterday and I guess there's a there's a clinic out there doing like a finger prick testosterone test. They literally checked five numbers. Uh, they took like testosterone, estrogen, ALT, AST, and maybe cholesterol, I think. And uh, prescribed like, yeah, you you need two hundred milligrams of testosterone a week. You need two anastrozole a week. Just from five numbers, I was like, how two anastrozole? Like two milligrams of anastrozole? Yeah, nobody needs that. You no. need, well, no chemotherapy patients might need that, but <laughs> any. Yeah, any normal person will never need that much, and you don't you don't need an astrazole most of the time. It's all about changing the dose and the frequency of your testosterone to control your estradiol levels. And the other thing, a couple of critical points I always want to make when I'm trying to educate men on hormones. Number one is do not get do not be injecting a testosterone ester, cypionate or otherwise that is dissolved in cottonseed oil. Cottonseed is a cotton is a GMO crop and every uh, commercial brand of testosterone that I have tested about 13 of them all in they're all in cottonseed oil it's a waste product of the cotton industry and they're all highly contaminated with glyphosate glyphosate injected into your body is one of the main reasons that men are getting gynecomastia on on TRT glyphosate is a powerful estrogen it's like what fentanyl is to the opioid receptor glyphosate is well Glyphosate's like oxycodone to the opioid receptor. Atrazine is like fentanyl to the opioid receptor. But glyphosate contaminates all of these commercial pharmaceutical industry manufactured testosterones. Get a grape seed oil or sesame seed oil, or an, but a, a food grade non-GMO oil as the, as the carrier for your testosterone. That's critical. Uh, number, number two is don't, you don't need anastrozole. Change your, you know, and don't be afraid of estrogen. Estrogen is an absolutely uh, critical hormone in men. It's not for women and testosterone's for men. No, that is nonsense. But, you know, I like to see in the lab core reference range, to give you some solid numbers, I like to see estradiol in like the 35 to 65, 75, 80 range. Here's the two key questions to ask yourself or your patient. If estradiol is rising too high, if it's too high, the two critical questions are: Let's say you're you got an estradiol of 85, and you're worried about is that is that a bad level? Well, it's a bad level if you are having prolonged duration to orgasm. If it's taking too long to reach a climax, you'll get similar effects when it's real when estradiol is really low. By the way, but high estradiol, you can it can be symptomatic. There are some docs. Um, I'm. I'm not sure if you've interviewed them, but there are some docs that believe no level of estradiol is is bad for you. I believe there's a lot of things that are worth measuring, and especially everything in that hormone pathway, pregnenolone, DHEA, estradiol, et cetera. Obviously, testosterone-free in total. 
But um, but I believe that in my 30 years and probably 40,000 patients, and I can't tell you how many millions of lab tests, I'm good at pattern recognition. And I ask a lot of questions. Um, when you ask a, an individual if they're having problems at w- with their estradiol level or what symptoms they might be having, no leading questions, you just ask questions. What symptoms are you having? You will find that someplace in the 85 plus, most men, not all, will have some, uh, man, it's taking me forever to finish. I'm, I'm wearing out my wife. Sometimes it's the wife that complains about it and tells us. And I didn't realize that that's what it could be. So it, it could be maybe something else, but let's, you know, but I've done that 10,000 times and learned it's in some men that estradiol, when it gets above a certain threshold, it's the prolonged duration of orgasm and a diminishment in the pleasure of orgasm hmm. that can occur when estradiol is too high. And that will probably blow the minds of some guys that are suffering that kind of stuff out there because they're being told a little bit different message. So I may be wrong on that in general, and maybe I'm just asking the questions or maybe I'm, I have my own internal biases, but that's what I have found. So I would just say it's worth considering that slightly different perspective on whether there is any level of estradiol. And I would tell you that the body, every system in the body, it's, you know, it's about homeostatic windows. There are windows that it operates within. Too much is bad, too little is bad. It's, you know, it's the Goldilocks effect for almost everything in the body. Yeah. And so where's your stance on an astrozol? Obviously, you're not an advocate of a lot of it. But so are you, are you to the extreme of Dr. Nichols and Ruzier, or are you kind of more in the, in the middle of like Dr. I would say I'm pretty close to them. Um, I, I re- by the way, I really ap- appreciate, you know, Keith's and uh, you know, Ruzier's and Nichols and, and Dr. Rob's contribution to the science here. I've learned a lot from them. I'm, I'm close. I'm, I'm a lot closer to them. I do recognize that, um, you know, probably 1% of my, I, I have probably, a few prescriptions that I prescribe a nasrazol of maybe a quarter milligram once a week, because you got a you you got a a guy that's been on the couch for twenty years. He's a hundred pounds overweight. He's a big aromatizer. He's getting symptoms from an estradiol of one hundred and forty. And you know we've done we've already done the spread out your dosing to every other day, and he's still aromatizing to a high level of estradiol that's giving him symptoms. So that's a situation where. I'm going to use every tool that I can. I've already tried, you know, I'll use the natural aromatase inhibitors, zinc. Every man should be on, every human should be on zinc about 80 milligrams daily. Why? Because very two very large randomized controlled trials that showed that about 80 milligrams of zinc daily decreases the incidence significantly of, of prostate cancer and macular degeneration, the, the loss of your central vision. Um, so that's an easy intervention. Zinc a, is a a mild aromatase inhibitor, so is green tea, so is vitamin C. So those are all good things to do that have no downside. I would much rather use those, you know, secondarily. So first is dose, drop that dose, you know, the bigger the dose that a man injects, the greater proportion of that dose will convert to estradiol. So if you're, if you're aromatizing, if you're doing 0.5 twice a week and your estradiol is too high, well, Let's go, you know, to 0.3 or 0.35 three times a week. And, and you know, so, or point, if you're 0.3 twice a week, too much estradiol, 0.2 three times a week. You'll find that in doing that simple uh, modification, decreasing the dose, increasing the frequency will not only decrease your estradiol, but it'll raise your total in three a little bit as well because less of that testosterone is converting to estradiol. You know, I'm... I rarely prescribe it, but there, I, I am not an absolutist in anything. It, right. if there, we've got a medicine. It's a very powerful one, by the way. Nobody should, almost no one should be taking a, a one milligram. It comes in typically um, in one milligram tablets. And I will often have it compounded in a quarter milligram, or I'll say, if you can get a pill cutter and quarter it, I've done it. It's easy to do. They're little round things. Get a V little pill cutter, and you can cut that into quarters. But um, start really low, quarter milligram once a week, and measure the effect. Because the last thing that we want to be doing is dropping men's estradiol levels 
to dangerous, you know, insufficient levels that will leave that patient at a higher cardiovascular risk, risk of bone loss, sexual dysfunction. And, and the thing, the thing a lot of docs don't understand, even experts, estradiol is critical to the, the DNA transcription and the creation of, of testosterone receptors. So estradiol is one of the important feedback hormones that is you can't live without it and you can't your testosterone can't work well without it. And, you know, I'll give you an example. I saw a doctor the other day, 64 year old, relatively healthy male, and he's on a hormone, you know, kind of cookie cutter hormone clinic, one milligram of anastrozole twice a week. I think it was 0.4 milligrams of test sip twice a week. And um, he was like, man, it's just, I might as well not be on it. I don't feel anything. It worked for a while. doesn't, and his, his total testosterone like was like 1100 free was 20.7, but his estradiol was nine. And I was like, okay, well, trust me on this. Cause I've seen this one thousands of times. I said, we got to We got to get that at, stop the anastrozole because what it's doing is robbing you of your estradiol. Right. Without the estradiol, you're not creating the receptors. You know, when we measure hormones, we're measuring hormones floating around in the bloodstream. They don't do anything just floating around in the bloodstream, Ben. They they have to enter the cytoplasm in the nucleus and hit those nuclear receptors to do anything. That's why we got to measure free testosterone. So that testosterone can look amazing. You know, and I see this lots of times in women as well. Tons of, of testosterone, they should be feeling great by all bodybuilder message board <laughs> kind of discussion streams, right? But they, they feel like crap because they've got an estradiol that is insufficient to be able to create the receptors. You let that estradiol come up a little bit and, and you know, 30, 30 plus, they'll now start creating a receptor population that can then receive that testosterone. And then what you'll see happen is there's they're without changing the dose of the testosterone, just by stopping the anastrozole, letting the estradiol come up, the estradiol is now creating receptors, you'll see the testosterone go down because it's now binding, being consumed. It's not just floating around like a kid that skips school, causing problems, you know, secondary, <laughs> more more uh, unusual hair growth and androgenic problems. It's actually binding where it needs to bind and doing the work that it needs to do but men that are getting, you know, mega doses of, you know, chemotherapeutic doses of anastrozole, they're 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 not getting the full benefits from their hormone therapy that they think they sh that they should be getting. Does that make sense? Yeah, it totally makes sense. Where are you where do you sit on the high end of the testosterone spectrum? Dr. Keith says he doesn't even care about free testosterone. He's just measuring total and he puts it he puts someone's weekly dose up as high as it needs to go to get his free testosterone. To, to wherever it needs to be to have no symptoms. I'm curious if you kind of sit on that container or do you follow the, the medical guidelines? Um, well, I don't. I, well, I'm going to say I follow the medical guidelines. The uh, But no, I, I, so what I follow, I, I'm i more, a little bit more scientific in the process. So I don't care what the total testosterone is. I I do not care. Why? Because I've studied the, the databases, the, I've seen the patients, the, High level elite athletes, they they won't feel good at 900. You know, they they'll still be symptomatic at 900. When you study the Olympic athlete database, you're going to see something that will blow your mind. The you know that 22 year old baseball player, professional baseball player, blew my mind and everybody on the endocrinology team at at Wash U. That's the you know when you start to realize that we all have a different hormonal fingerprint. And so I'm going to like Keith does. He's right. You know it's symptoms that really really matter. But I'm looking more at what I have found is probably 20 to 45 or 50 free testosterone is the sweet spot for almost every man on the planet. But if it takes an 1800 or a 2200 total testosterone to get a, you know, a 25 or a 30 free, that's what I'm looking for. Why, why am I focused on free? Well, because it's the only testosterone that's going to actually enter the cell and work at the work at that level and and Keith is kind of doing the same thing just in a, a little bit different way but I measure I like to measure it I like to have some objective measure but it, I'll never subvert the laboratory measurement 
to symptomology. So I think Keith and I are probably pretty aligned on that. But I, I do like to measure. I like, you know, I, I've gotten good at this by pattern recognition. I couldn't develop the pattern recognition that I have without having a pattern, you know, in the, the data, the objective data that I can obtain over right. 30 years and tens of thousands of patients. That's what's really helped me to be able to problem solve when I see something that falls outside of that, that pattern. And I can tell you that some of these guys that think they got it figured out, they, they, they're, they, for the most part, they got 80% of it figured out perhaps, but they, they tend to be my best patient refer, refers because not everybody fits into that little mold that they've created for their practice. Right. You know, you put a, you put a whole bunch of, of transdermal testosterone on the scrotum of a man um, with a monoamine oxidase A polymorphism, a significant one, and he's a panic attack happening and going to the ER because that that high DHT interacted with that enzyme that breaks down important neurotransmitters, and he's having a panic attack. Or he's that roid rage. I mean, that's that's where the roid rage idea comes from, or the symptom and syndrome comes from, in my opinion, it's monoamine oxidase A mutations. It's about 37% of the population, Ben. That monoamine oxidase A mutation, about 37% of men, if you drive their DHT levels super high with a high dose transcrotal cream only approach, you've got it, you got them, uh, you're creating harm in your patient. They're going to, they're going to have panic attacks. And I got a bunch of those patients um, in my practice now because a doctor did that and wouldn't listen to them because they had a, they had a mindset that said, no, no amount is too much. It's, you know, I, I don't know what the mindset is. I can't understand it. You listen to your patient and they, and when they have kind of s symptoms that stump you, try to figure out what it is, what, understand what it is. Don't always write it off as, oh, well, they must be drinking a bunch of alcohol and, you know, smoking marijuana and, you know, Krispy Kreme's Mountain Dew McDonald's. It's, it's often not that. It's, it's that unique physiology that we all have at different levels. And, and um, if you figure it out, you'll realize that you can't have one approach to hormone replacement therapy. And that's an important point. A lot of us that are, you know, experts in this field or do a lot in this field, uh, we do it differently. And I would say everybody's doing a good job at improving men over where they are at, and their deficiency. Yeah. And there's, you know, are there better ways to do it? I think there are, but the best way to do it is listen to your patient, have more than one tool in your toolkit. Don't hit every patient with the same approach. And whenever possible, replicate that beautiful physiology that we see in the healthiest members of our population and consider that rhythmic, that rhythmicity is an important part of that. Right. I love that you, you went there because that was my next question, actually. So when you talk about using other tools, what percentage of guys that come into your clinic are you actually prescribing testosterone for? Like if someone comes in, they're clinically low, you go straight to testosterone, or are you looking at lifestyle and training interventions as well? Oh, you got it. Yeah. So I assume by the time they've hit me that they have, um, well, I don't assume I ask, but you've got to do the lifestyle things, you know? So I created a framework called Mindset, and it's an acronym of the seven key elements of health, wellness, and vitality. So the M in mindset is the microbiome and mind, body, spirit. I is inflammation control and is nutrition. D, detoxification. S is um, sleep. E is exercise. And T is total hormone balance. So I really start, I use that framework to say, you know, we got to work on the gut microbiome, decrease inflammation. Got to, no more Krispy Kreme's, Mountain Dew, McDonald's. Let's, you know, let's clean up your diet. So those things absolutely have to be done because, Quite honestly, we wouldn't have the problems we're having if we if people treated food as their medicine, and uh, and so um, and you got to be moving your body. So those things are absolutely given, and I have people in my office that kind of dig into that separately, so I can focus on the medicine. The way I look at hormones, Ben, here's the answer to your question: um, I, they're like water to a garden, and I use this analogy all the time. Every cell in your body has, re except red blood cells, has receptors or testosterone, estradiol, uh, pretty much progesterone as well. Every cell. Um, if you think of a garden, it's not receiving water. It's wilting and withering. 
when your body is deficient in hormones, those those cells and the tissues that those cells make up and the organ system that those tissues create, they are wilting and withering. You're shutting down and your body is starting to rob from one area to try to keep things going. And often it will cycle down like that. We start, you know, I, I it's 95% of the patients that come to me, by the time they reach me, they're ref- it's almost always referral or it might be, you know, friend, uh, a patient and majority are patient referrals. But they're, I, I'm the first thing I'm looking at is their hormone, you know, their, their hormone levels because it's, it's the common deficiency. The light on the dashboard, right? It's like check it's, engine. I, it's, it's the, the signal has been going off for a long time and we're ignoring it in medicine because they're natural. They don't pay for anything. You know, the pharmaceutical industry can't patent natural substances like testosterone. In fact, they spend more money trying to discredit testosterone, estradiol, and natural hormones for lots of reasons. Not only does it not make money as a, as a, uh, you know, drug class, but it solves a lot of problems that they got elegant, expensive drugs for the diseases that result from a hormone deficiency that goes untreated. So that's why, that's why your doctors are ignorant about it because there's no focus in medical school. There's no, even in, you know, that's why endocrinologists know embarrassingly little about sex hormone physiology. I mean, I, I could have fun with a conference of endocrinologists. You give me uh, Rob Comey and Eric and Keith Nichols and Neil Rousier, let us, you know, have a panel and, and interrogate every um, endocrinologist at a conference and put that on YouTube and it will be the number one comedy in the country in a very short period of time because those people know nothing about sex hormone physiology or very little for the most part. They know a ton about a bunch of very expensive ways to regulate your insulin receptor or insulin um, in general, and and that's it. And that's why they're failing at what they do. I've cured more cases of type two diabetes than a whole conference full of endocrinologists because they're focused on the wrong stuff. Right. But I look at it, huh? Yeah, with some more testosterone replacement therapy. I think that one of the studies said about eighty five percent of all cases of type two diabetes in men has. Um, uh, testosterone deficiency, hormonal imbalances as a driving yeah. factor. Yeah. So I look at it like that. I, I, I'm i looking, you know, in my training, I, I did a fellowship in functional medicine. Really kind of focus you in a different framework of looking for root causes. I'm not just putting Band-Aids on problems, treating symptoms. I'm trying to find a root cause. What one thing could explain this man's depression, weight gain, inflammation, you know, the uh, uh, lack of libido hasn't had a, an erection ever. He can't remember one. His relationship is being destroyed. He's, you know, he's on his third job. Anyway, the list goes on. What one thing could cause all of those? Well, very often it's because he has a testosterone level of 260 and his primary care physician said, yeah, that's not the problem. You just need more Prozac. You, you must have been born with a Prozac deficiency and a Lipitor deficiency. So let me, let me correct that, you know, uh, omission on God's design in your body, Jim. Well, and statins is a whole nother thing that will won't rob you. Yeah, <laughs> what a respectful of your time. I would love to have you back do this again because this is a great conversation. Yeah, so much value. We could sit sitting here and talk for three hours. I'm sure. Oh yeah, I, I appreciate it, Ben. I, I would love to. I I mean, this is something I love talking about. I'm very passionate about it. It absolutely changed my life. I I would be I I, I pro I'd be dead. I'd be divorced. My, I'd be estranged from my children. Getting my deficiency treated uh, made me a better father, a better husband, a better human being. Yeah. I mean, and I, I, that's what I love about my job is I've done that for, you know, 40,000 plus men now. Yeah. And that is what I went into medicine for. That's a life well lived. And that's why I don't work anymore. I show up, I talk to people and I help them find their way out of the darkness that my stupid, broken profession is just destroying, quite honestly. Um, and I help them find their way out of that. So if I can ever do anything to help educate, and I, I love you and I appreciate what you're doing to educate men because, man, we got to get back. We, got, we need hard, strong men again, or our grandchildren are doomed. And I am not going to leave this world, leaving this dystopian nightmare in the hands of my grandchildren to fix. So- Anything I can do 
to lock shields with you, brother, and let's fix it because it's an imperative. It's an imperative for me, you know, as I know it is for you too. And, and so the one thing that comes to mind as you say that is, you know, you and I were bo- both born pre-ubiquitous technology, right? So you you were born with a cell phone. I wasn't born with a cell phone. I didn't have a computer. I didn't have video games. Yeah. So we're, we're the last generation that was born pre-ubiquitous technology. Now all these kids that are born, this is all they know. So I think we have this responsibility on our shoulders to say, hey, I see that it's tempting. I see that they're trying to steal your time and attention. I see that it's it's something you desire. I see it's something you enjoy. I see there's value in it. And there's additional things you need to do. There's additional things you need to do to be a high-functioning human, to be a high-functioning man, to be a man of integrity and, and a high, have a high moral compass. And so as leaders in our society and our culture as men, we must take responsibility and teach those kids about what exists outside of the ubiquitous technology because if we don't do it, they're going to be they're going they're going to be taken over by, as you say, the marketing, the yeah. the, the big media. Because it is appealing, man. It's so desirable to sit and play video games all day or sit yeah. in front of your computer all day. Because there's so much mindless entertainment. Mm-hmm. So we need to teach these guys, hey, work. It. There's value in work. There's value in discomfort. There's value in leading and, and and connecting with people. Yeah, it sure is. Yeah, we're a few generations away from those floating platforms with. You know, you saw in that cartoon Wall-E, you know, those ginormous humans just sucking soda pop and stuffing their face um, yep. while they watch their screens, you know, constantly. That's, that's... Uh, Video games and, and drugs, man. Yeah. All the drugs and, and, and so everybody... And I'll even go... And think, think of anything. I'll go even one step farther and tell you that if we, if I had had those things, I'm not the strongest man on the planet. If I had had those video games... Um, when I was in high school, I, I don't think I ever would have amounted to anything because right. even as an adult, I, I became addicted to some of those video games like World of Warcraft for a while. And I realized that is my kryptonite. That is dangerous to me. The little spikes of dopamine and pleasure that I would get from that, so addictive. And so I've been really, you know, teaching that to my children, my grandchildren. Right. And um, I can tell you, you fathers out there, when b- please buy some land and start growing your own food and giving your kids and grandkids yep. a place to run around. They they will have more. Yeah, they will. It it will it will be good for everybody, and you can be co- become a part of the resistance that may be able to save this planet. Yeah, that's my mission for this year, Jim. It's funny. I, I'm like, I'll be a farmer by the end of 2024, man. Mark, brother. Next the time, best thing I ever did. Over else the best thing I ever did. And you'll, you know, your big brain will really enjoy learning all these new skills and everything. It's so good. Yeah. Just uh, follow that Joel Saladin of Polyface Farms. He's, he's a real, you know, he's a real leader in this movement and he's got some great science that I think you're last name for me. Would you? Saladin. It's like salad with an I N at the end. S A L A D I N. Joel Saladin, Polyface Farms. Um, he is really, I'm, I'm very, he is like the, he, he's the best mind that I've seen in this space. Super genius. Wow. And he'll teach you how to do regenerative farming in a way that makes sense. Yeah. Amazing. I'll get him on the podcast. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, dude. I think you would, I would, I would watch that one in the, you know, listen to it endlessly because he's got lots of wisdom. All right, man, man. I love your energy. I love your, I love right. your uh, drive. Keep it up you being, being who you are. All right. Keep. Keep me educated with your podcast, brother, because it's been good. Keep it up. God bless you. Talk soon, Jim. Thanks for listening to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. For full episode guides with important takeaways and bonus resources, head over to muscleintelligence.com slash learn. If you enjoy the show and find value in the content, please subscribe, share this podcast with at least one person you know and love who would benefit from this content, leave us a review, and support our sponsors. You can see the full list of show sponsors, discounts, and get exclusive muscle intelligence deals at muscleintelligence.com slash resources. To join our private community and get VIP access to my master classes, upcoming muscle camps, and other resources that we don't post anywhere else, head to muscleintelligence.com slash community. Most of all, thank you very much for your trust, for your time, and most importantly, for supporting health and fitness in this world. Enjoy your day. I look forward to seeing you here next week. 
Thank you so much for tuning in to Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Bikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.